All right, I do believe we left off in the area of involvement uh, with the people that you minister to, and we left off, I believe, on page 51 with being honest. Is that what you have where your pen stopped? All right, at the top of page 51 where it says, as you are involved with people, you're building friendships with them, you are looking at a, a discipleship relationship with them for life, uh, this particular point is be honest. Uh, be honest about your credentials and academic qualifications. In other words, I, I'm not going to pretend to practice law. I'm not going to pretend to practice medicine. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not an attorney. I, I, I'm not going to do that. It just let them know who you are and that you are a student of the Word of God. Um, and whenever, it depends on when you're talking with them and they ask, don't pretend to be something you're not. Now, I know, you know some of you may have uh, medical degrees or even law degrees, and that's, that's fine, but still try to just keep in the area of Scripture um, when you're ministering to them in this area of discipleship counseling. But just communicate that you are a servant of Christ, and you are going to handle God's Word, which is sufficient for life and godliness. It contains what we need in pointing them to Christ. But at the same time, I'm going to encourage them to get a checkup uh, with a physician. Um, I may, like yesterday on a phone call in a counseling situation uh, out of state, uh, they needed to talk to a, a family a lawyer, a family attorney, because some issues they were going in a, uh, a divorce proceedings and custody of children and all kinds of ramifications of what this mother will do or not do or can do that, that you're getting into law issues legal issues and they needed to talk to an attorney so you know you you're trying to think through here uh, another person I'm talking with it just sounds by the way she's eating and her diet I'm, I'm not an expert on nutrition and so see your doctor uh, she has some tendencies, much like my wife, who's hypoglycemic, that uh, if not careful, you could think you're depressed a lot when it could be a blood sugar problem. So just get checked out. And then see a nutritionist, get a recommendation to a nutritionist because of how she's struggling with eating issues and just a, a good, healthy, proper diet. And someone will work with her and, and her, what she's doing in uh, her family and life and uh, how much she needs calorie wise and just eat a well-balanced meal so those are kind of things that I'm going to use uh, the wisdom that is out there uh, especially in areas where uh, it can be very helpful uh, to them as I counsel yes is, there, is that an automatic thing do you see something eating wise that you refer to a doctor is there anything that you automatically refer to uh, Yes, there are things that are more uh, alarming that I want to know. Uh, you know, if they say I'm just struggling with lying, <laughs> you know, I, I can kind of keep to the scripture on that. I don't think the doctor is going to uh, find an, an issue there. But other issues, you know, when they're not resting well, when things are going on with they just feel like they drop over, they get these severe headaches, you know, there are things, in, especially bodily uh, effects, uh, they just need to get tested to see, you know, rule out at least. Uh, you don't want to be dealing with someone with a tumor going on and saying, well, it's a spiritual issue. You just really need to rejoice in Christ and not be down. And, so you know, yes, and I, I like to see that they've gotten a good medical exam anyway and keep, uh, especially the older they get, it's just, it's recommended at least once a year that they get a good checkup. I think it, I'm not sure, is it after 40? It says after, a, after 50, at least once a year, you know, you get just the body's decaying and just kind of keep up with what. As a counselor, do you, can you ask for that? For the yeah, I do. Oh, for the results? Uh, you can get release forms, but the patient has to, you know, make sure they sign off. And I, I would only want it if I'd like to keep in touch somehow with someone if it's, like anorexia, I mean, one out of 10 die. That's the you know, statistics, or one out of 12, depending on who you read. Well, that, you know, and if someone says, I'm, 
I'm starving myself to death, you know, on this quest for thinness, and one out of ten drop dead, I, I'm not going to counsel with them unless they're also seeing a physician. A regular, you know, regular visits where uh, they can be tested, blood work, uh, make sure they're, they're having the right uh, true chemicals in their body they need, the electrolytes and various things. And, you know, if it gets in, a, in the danger zone, they need to be hospitalized if they're going to be willful about not obeying Scripture. So it depends on what the issues are. But uh, when they are struggling with issues, uh, even bulimia, where they're throwing up regularly, you know, uh, mortality rate is not that high with them, but there is still a percentage because of the acidic nature uh, of the stomach acids and ruptured esophagus and various things that just, uh, they need, part of the pursuing Christ-likeness is let's just make sure we're going to be a good steward of the body that God has entrusted to us. But not every issue. If it's a marital issue and they're having a conflict, I, although, depending on what age uh, that she's in, uh, she may be going through menopause. And that, you know, or a real difficult, serious, difficult menstrual cycle, which she doesn't get checkups for, doesn't know much about, just knows she's irritable all the time. Well, there's no excuse for sin. But if she can find out that, wow, she's having a difficult time here and maybe they can work with uh, at least the hormones a bit that um, help her through this time in her life. Again, no excuse for sin, but uh, to treat the body in such a way to ease it that, hey, she's, she's not as, uh, you know, fangs aren't coming out and... Um, it's more of a, a, a doable, even with God's grace, it's just not as tense. So that's different than just throwing pills at them. This is really uh, looking at what's going on in their life. That's a good question. All right, uh, next here, uh, be honest about your own problems and sin, but be wise in your sharing, All right. especially if they struggle with gossip. Uh, but be, be honest about your own problems and sin. Sometimes, uh, and I mentioned this already, it's not that you turn the whole time of ministering to them into talking about you, but there is a place where you can talk to them that God has worked in your heart and life, you also struggle with particular issues. When a guy is talking about lust in his life, uh, and no one else talks about it around him, I mean, they can kind of think maybe they're the only one that's struggling with this, and be able to say, you know, there was a time in my life where I know exactly what you're struggling with in the sense of the severity of it, but God in his grace has worked in my life, and I'm going to take you through the principles in God's word that I've been practicing. That just, wow, someone else, you know, this is, there's no temptation that's unique to man, right? It's, it's common. So just be, uh, that can be a very helpful thing to do about your values and convictions and standards, uh, about your agenda, goals and methods. What are you seeking to accomplish? Let them know that, that you're not going to be meeting with them for years and years in intensive work here. Uh, this should be something that you can get in, deal with biblically by the help of the Spirit of God, but you will be friends for life, but this is not an ongoing thing for years and years and years. And your goal is that to see them be more like Jesus, to know him and be more like him. Letter I, model the fruit of the Spirit. Again, you, as Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ in uh, 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. But model the fruit of the Spirit. You can't expect them to deal with their anger if you're angry with them. And you're impatient with them. Uh, you have to model the fruit of the Spirit. And that's, a, again, qualities that build good relationships. And I remember one pastor who was actually let go of a church because he was, his anger was coming out as he would visit visitors. And uh, they wouldn't come back to church. And 
you know, the other leaders asked why, you know, met up with a visitor and said, why, why, you know, you'd love to have you back. There's no way we're coming back with that pastor. You know, he gets angry right in our face, in our home. What? And then that, you know, explored. You, you can't, you can't do that as you're ministering to someone uh, and, and not be in control by the Spirit of God. Letter J, communicate clearly. Again, this is just in your involvement with them, as you're uh, speaking God's word to them, as you're dialoguing with them. Communicate clearly. And, and the passages here are fairly familiar to you. Make sure that it's good content. It's the truth. That's Ephesians 4.25, right? Putting aside all lying, speak the truth one to another. And with the right motivation, in Ephesians 4.29, it's uh, put aside all unwholesome speech. Instead, speak that which builds up or edifies the other. At the right time, you know, if they're very discouraged, it's not the time to bring out five more issues that they're struggling with. <laughs> yeah, that's a... Uh, that's what Jesus meant when he said, you know, a broken reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not flick out. It, it, you know, when someone's discouraged, it's not the time to say, well, you think that's bad. You know, I've noticed five other things that you're sinning in. <laughs> this is not the time. That's very helpful in your marriage relationship and in parenting. Uh, in the right manner, and that is a very gentle spirit, and in the right location, in Proverbs 25, about apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in the right circumstance, the right, the right location. Then letter K, listen well. And that's hard to do as a preacher. Hard to do for those that want to talk uh, is to listen well. And you will meet people, and this is what's a, a struggle, is um, some of you are very direct. I mean, you ask a question, and you go directly for the answer. I mean, it's a straight beeline. I, I can sum all that up in one sentence. But there's people that you're going to be ministering to who are all over the place. I mean, they take a journey uh, to finally get there. And what's difficult by this is that y you don't go with them on that journey, <laughs> right? You, you see where they're, you're following them for a little while, and right here about you check out. And now you're kind of thinking about the sermon you're working on and some other points, and maybe this would be alliterated better. <laughs> uh, and tomorrow I think I can arrange my schedule this way. And you're thinking through the week, and then you sort of join up with them again about here for just the remainder all right. And you sort of check out. And you do that with uh, other people as well. Uh, and your wife will know it. If you're married, she'll know it immediately when you've checked out. Some of you are nodding and smiling. You've been there. And uh, what you have to do, because uh, I'm kind of like that. I just, I'll just go direct. Uh, you have to go with them for a while but then try to help them in the course of that day or in the weeks to come. Try to help them not go so high and not so low. Just got some things to cover. Maybe we can just streamline a little bit. Not like this. I don't mean be like my desire, but I want to care for you, but I want to try to bring you down so that you're not going up as high and low, and I need to work better at following people. Because actually you can gain some helpful information all along here. So it's how to work with them uh, in this communication. But listen well. And it's harder to listen. And again, I don't know how they determine this. Uh, but in the educational realm, in their studies, they estimate that the brain, your mind goes four times as fast as your mouth which it's hard to listen. I mean, there are several reasons why. One is maybe you're boring. You know, I mean, the person who's talking is boring. Some of you are already yawning. Uh, number two, it's hard to listen if you're tired. 
And the thing you don't want is someone's there saying, oh, this is what happened. I mean, it was just awful. And you're going, <laughs> you know, and, and that's, you need to do what you can at that point. Get something, uh, chew some gum, uh, write, stand up if you have to. Take a break if you have to and just say, you know, let's just, just, just take a short break here. It's better to do that than fall asleep on someone. I've been there. <laughs> oh, it's awful. So I'll do what I need to do. Uh, even if they go take a break, I just got here 20 minutes ago. Yeah, but you weren't up all night. Yeah, you know, with a situation that was, and so you, let's just take a break, five minutes, get some water, whatever we need to do. Um, but, you know, again, if it's boring, if you're tired, uh, if they're going way off on some, I mean, they're not even rabbit trails, they're just so far off the direct answer, it's just hard to pay attention. If your mind's going that fast, you tend to wander, daydream. So ask God for grace to listen well. Be solution-oriented. Uh, I think I, I remember doing this, and I'm, now I'm trying to remember was it in this class or not. But this is a, a tendency here that we want to just discuss problems. We just see problems. And here's the problem. I can define the problem. Matter of fact, I can add to your problems. Uh, your person says, I, just, um, I feel in despair. Well, that's half your problem. If you don't know the Lord, hell awaits. Let's talk about that problem. And, and you know, you're you kind of you're just problem-oriented. You can spot problems. And uh, the reason why when I assign critiques and courses that I, I'll teach is I want strengths and weaknesses. Because you, know, you just can begin really sharp on critiques on just spotting problems, but you also be, need to be able to spot the graces and the good things, like uh, Christ did with the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, both. But you have to watch out from this issue here. What's the difference between that person and this person? This is a person who has a problem. What's this? <laughs> uh oh, here comes a problem person. You know, here comes that black hole. I, I mean, I've heard that kind of thing. You know, that, that's a oh, they're just they're just a a black hole. You get involved in their life, they're just a black hole. What is that's not even caring uh, communication. I know what people mean by that. What they mean is this. This is a person. <laughs> that's got lots of problems. But if we're not careful in involvement and caring for people like Christ does, we miss the person. And all we see is problems. But what we want to do is say, you know, there are solutions to all of these. I want to help you biblically to know Christ and see the solutions, but I don't want to view you as a problem. And so be solution-oriented even as you view people who have maybe a lot of issues, a lot of problems. And then pray with and for the disciple. And that, that's not set times. I mean, I, I like to pray before. I like to pray at the end and at times in between. You know, if, if you say, how did the week go? What, what happened through the week? And they tell you, and just say, you know, this, what a wonderful praise item. Why don't we just pray and thank the Lord? for what he did this past week in your life. Um, or they share a burden. You know, my mom's got cancer, my dad's been diagnosed, well, let, let's just pray right now. Uh, and cast that care on the Lord and ask for his will to be done. Just show them you live by prayer. You live uh, constantly communing with Christ. All right, now we're switching to another uh, element in the area of discipleship counseling. And it's on the next page, page 52, which is gathering data. Gathering data. 
when a person comes and says, I'm, I'm struggling with issues or an issue, you have to gather information or your interpretation will be skewed. If you don't gather a lot of data, you're in great danger of a wrong interpretation. I can remember back years ago when in church, where there would be some physicians at our church, people would be asking them, and it was unfair, we had to actually say some things to the congregation. They were, the, these guys couldn't even come and worship without being, feeling like they're in a clinic, uh, people at the church. And so we, we just made announcements, stop that. You know, do not do this kind of thing. They're here to worship and learn just like you are, not to do business per se. Well, there were times when you, you could just say, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I got a headache, seems like sinus. Oh, yeah, here, you know, just take this or I'll call you in something. No more. It's come see me at the office and we're going to go through the regular regimen of checkup, blood pressure, everything. Why? Yeah, you could treat symptoms and you could misdiagnose something. And you're just saying, well, I, you know, flu's going around? Sure. Uh, I can remember my son when he was three years old. I don't think I shared this with you. Where he was uh, uh, coughing, throwing up. It was about every half hour. And so we took him to the pediatrician. And he said, oh, yeah, there's this bad flu, the stomach flu going around and gave him some uh, medications to take. We did that for about half a day, and I was getting about every 15 minutes throwing up with the medication. Went back up there. Um, he came in and met us there in the evening because he said, it's not right, that shouldn't be. And now it, it puzzled him more. He said, I'm, I'm concerned. This is not the flu. This is not the stomach virus thing and so he went in he said just give me a, a second here he went into his office he pulled out some books was looking at some of the symptoms and what's going on and he said you know uh, I, I need to uh, call a friend of mine who's a an internist and um, he said I, I think he's got the markings of an issue going on with his intestines where the large one swallows up the small and I, I need to call, and sure enough, the surgeon said, that has all of the classic symptoms. Get them down here, stat. So we were uh, in the car going down you know, uh, to the hospital. They did this ultrasound. They found where it was happening. Uh, it was swallowing up the small, and he was dying. And uh, I mean, within half hour, he was in surgery. And uh, it was successful. I mean, they got it, they found it, they repaired it. Um, and a couple of things happened there. One is, well, one, we were praising God and thanking him. But at the same time, my respect of our pediatrician went way up. One is, yes, he thought it was just the stomach virus that was going around. That probably wasn't wise, just saying, I uh, just but you know, one child after another you can make that mistake. But the second time he said, uh-uh, this is something else. And he, it was out of his league in the sense of this is, this is something I need to call someone else for their input. And uh, they got it. So that's part of ministering and discipling is being honest about what you know, don't know. I'm going to get some help. But I need to gather a lot of information to make sure. And that's part of gathering data is uh, making sure. A couple of passages you don't have listed there is in Deuteronomy 17 and Deuteronomy 19. It's uh, some instructions for the nation of Israel. When someone accuses someone else of something, uh, namely false worship, in Deuteronomy 17 it says, if it's told you uh, about someone, another Israelite, worshiping a false god, 
and you've heard of it, then you shall inquire thoroughly. That's the text. You shall inquire thoroughly. Uh, and then verse 6, on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, if it's true, he's to be put to death. In Deuteronomy 19, if someone's changing your boundaries, <laughs> this isn't the book on boundaries, this is actual, you know, the markings on your property. It says, a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity uh, or any sin. But on the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. And then it says, they should appear before the judges, and they shall investigate thoroughly. In, in, investigating thoroughly is to gather a lot of information, a lot of questions. The first time I meet with someone, that's what I'm doing. A lot of questions. Two things that are on my mind when I first meet with someone, unless it's a crisis situation, I'm gathering a lot of data and by being involved in their life and caring for them. And number two, I'm giving hope. If you can just remember that when you're meeting with people the first time, and I usually look about two hours at least to meet with someone for the first time of asking questions and giving hope. If they're an unbeliever, I'm going to point them to Christ. I may not go through the whole gospel at that sitting, but that's their need, and there's hope in Christ. If they're a believer, they have hope in God and his promises. And so we're going to look uh, to him and his word on that. So gathering data. Uh, I came across this in the paper, uh, I want to say about a year ago. If you like Sherlock Holmes or not, I don't know. But he and uh, Dr. Watson, it said, uh, was going, they were, went camping, and they pitched their tent under the stars. And during the night, Holmes wakes his companion and says, Watson, look up at the stars and tell me what you deduce. And Watson says, I see millions of stars, and even a few of those have planets. It's quite likely that there are some planets like Earth. If there are a few planets like Earth out there, there might also be life. And Holmes replied, Watson, you idiot. Somebody stole our tent. <laughs> don't, don't miss the obvious, right, when gathering data. All right, it's an essential step. If you don't ask questions and gather information, you'll do what Proverbs 18, 13 warns against. And if you answer a matter before you hear it, what? It's folly and shame. You're more foolish if you answer something without hearing it. We've all been there with people. And why gather data? Well, 1 Thessalonians 5.14, you're familiar with that passage where it says, rebuke the unruly, uh, admonish them. Secondly, encourage the faint-hearted. Uh, thirdly, help the weak and be patient with all men. Which one are you dealing with? Because you could end up admonishing the weak. Someone says, you know, I really need some help. What do you mean you need some help? You just need to be a more serious-minded Christian just needed some help. <laughs> um, someone's faint-hearted. You don't want to admonish them. You want to encourage the faint-hearted. They're trying to do right. Uh, they're growing weary and well-doing. Uh, and you don't want to encourage the unruly. Someone who says, I've had it. I'm not going to be married to that person. I'm out of here. Well, you know, I just want to encourage you here. <laughs> no. <laughs> you just Wait a minute. Let's find out who we're dealing with. And you have to ask questions. Which approach when you're dealing with individuals? How are you going to approach them? When you watch Jesus, even with two unsaved people, John 3 and John 4, there was a different approach. Even with the gospel. John 3 with Nicodemus, it was pretty direct. He wasn't walking all over the place here. He was just from A to B, right in his face. He should have known. But the woman at the well in John 4, he was very tender, very compassionate, moving. Uh, whatever topic she was bringing up, he was addressing. 
And number three there, what is the true issue? In Jeremiah 6, it says the false prophets uh, are saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. They're healing the deep brokenness of my people superficially. And that's, that's Christian counseling today. You know, that's the whole integration stuff. It's putting band-aids on real problems. It's saying, you know, the Bible says you've got cancer, and here, take a Tylenol. You are, here, you are dealing with deep heart issues superficially. And we don't want to do that. What's the true issue here? So we just have to gather information to know. Since we're not God, we're not omniscient. But we can know a lot what's going on in the heart because out of the heart flow the issues of life. And so as you look at their behavior, you'll know them by their fruit. As they talk, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks in Matthew 12. Where they put all their treasure, there their heart is. By actions, by communication, um, you can know some things that are going on in their heart. Again, not perfectly. Letter B, what kind of data to gather? Now, there's a, this is like an acronym here that uh, uh, Dr. Mack has put together, and it's in the book Intro to Biblical Counseling, where uh, this you, you'll like because the acronym, uh, PREACH. But it's made to just think through in categories as you're asking questions to make sure you ask questions in each category of their life. The first there is the physical area. Ask questions. You don't have to be a medical doctor here. Just ask questions. You know, uh, uh, have you been sleeping well? Have you slept at all? Medications, what are they taking? Because you can get a layman's guide, a PDR a reference guide to drugs to even know right there. I mean, what are they taking? What's that used for? Just be careful. Some drugs are used for various things. Uh, even Prozac is used for other things other than depression. Just, you just have to be careful. Uh, their diet, what are they eating, not eating? Watch, some people are on some strange diets these days. And, uh, you know, we're just told to eat in a very self-disciplined way for the glory of God, not to be always looking for diets. What's their activity level, any illness? Just physically. You know, you say you're anxious. How much coffee do you drink? I'm talking the leaded sort. You know, oh, a couple of pots a day. Well, that might have some bearing, you know, on a, just, you know, I don't drink much coffee. A couple of liters of Coke, though. You know, it's just, what's their intake? What, what, just physically ask some questions. Letter R, resources and relationships. This is in the area of people. How are they relating to people? Uh, parents, siblings, family members, church people. Well, who's in their life? Resources, relationships. Are they all alone in life? Uh, do they have, are they connected in their relationships? In the area of emotions or feelings, uh, where are those at? Are they very feeling-oriented? Are there extremes that are going on? Letter A is actions. You're, you're really looking for behavior. And not just sins of commission, but omission as well. Some people would say, well, I'm not doing that, uh, like the Pharisees. We're not committing adultery. Hmm. Well, let's talk about the heart. And also issues of omission. You're not doing what you should do. I know some that are so caught up with family that they're not serving in church. You know? They're just all family. Everything's family. Well, well, that's great, but you also are put in the body of Christ. In Ephesians 3 and 4, it's the body of Christ there before the family, the, the, the nuclear family, in uh, chapter 5 and chapter 6. Just be careful. You, know, you can get out of balance and say, I'm, so, I'm trying to do right here, but you're omitting serving over here. Uh, conceptual, the whole area of thinking. The Bible puts a real premium here on renewing your mind. And so what are their thinking, their values, their beliefs? And then historical. The H there, uh, 
looking past, is there any kind of pattern? What's the context? They weren't born two minutes ago. Uh, tell me a little bit about your life. And sometimes it's just interesting. You find people who are, uh, grew up in a military family. And they go, you know, in church, they, they really don't get too involved with people. Well, they moved every two years growing up. And it's just, why get close to people? We're going to be moving again. And you just, you just, you're looking for patterns, just saying, is there anything here in their context that would influence uh, this individual, both good and bad and failures and things that happen? You're just asking uh, for information here. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep moving if I can. I'll try to take questions maybe uh, during the break or afterwards. But let me just uh, start here on page 53, and then we'll take a break shortly. It says, how to gather data. Well, one way is using a form, and let's see if we can uh, bring this in a bit. Can you see that at all? I'm not sure if the light out would help um, over there. There we go, if that would help. This is uh, called a PDI form, or personal data inventory. This is the one the church uses here, at Grace Church. But, you know, this thing has been around since a long time ago. I mean, we were talking just, you just want to get information uh, on people. You can see the uh, type of form like this in the back of the Christian Counselor's Manual. Uh, but you're asking information, personal information about them. Uh, where are they from? Are they from here originally? Uh, that I ask separately off of this when they put, this is my home address, and I'll just say, are you a native here of Southern California? I mean, where, have you moved around? Where, are you, uh, where were you born? Uh, marital status. And you can see a single engaged, uh, married, separated, uh, divorced, widowed. And, uh, and when they check that, if they put a divorce, uh, some may check that three or four times because that's becoming quite the norm to be three or four times. Uh, and now you're going to have to ask questions uh, about these divorces, whether you ask it then or come back to it. You're going to have to find some information out about that because if they're having trouble in their present marriage, uh, what about those previous divorces, depending on which view you take on divorce and remarriage? Uh, could a previous divorce have bearing on this marriage? Absolutely. If it was done in an unbiblical fashion, uh, according to Matthew 5 and 19, it could be that this marriage uh, is one of those, quote, adulterous marriages, where uh, it's a strange situation. They shouldn't be married, but they are. So you can ask questions there. Marriage and family type questions. Uh, as far as spouse, employer, date of marriage, one couple, they'd been married over 50 years. They met and married on the same day. They were at this church. I've, you know, <laughs> met and married on the same day. Uh, and it was only God's grace that he saved them after that <laughs> and uh, worked in both their, their lives. But uh, there, there have been, uh, that's the fastest. I don't know that you can improve on that one. Uh, <laughs> Maybe uh, Isaac and Rebecca. <laughs> it was a pretty fast scenario there too, right? Right off the camel and <laughs> the bed. Uh, <laughs> but you know, date of marriage, length of dating, that might tell you some there that they, maybe they didn't know each other very well, and uh, then children came along quickly and. Uh, have they been previously married? Uh, children, names of their children, and you can be, put more lines if they need to put more children down. Uh, age, uh, gender, education, stepchild. Some will even put deceased, and that tells you something too. You know, they had a child that died, and when, and how did that affect? Now, just to, um, if you, this is more formal, right? You would use this more in formal counseling. This is not on the hallway here. A classmate comes up and says, hey, can I talk to you about something? Yeah, can you fill this out? You know, it's not. This is a, 
This is, I just happen to have it in my pocket, you know. Uh, this is more for formal counseling. They're coming to your church. You say, yeah, but they're a member of our church. I'd still have them fill it out. Just because they're a member, you don't have this kind of information on every member. Just have them fill this out, and it lets you know, and you just tell them, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. This starts the procedure as far as I need to know a lot before I answer. And I have yet to find one person who will argue with that. You know, if a medical doctor comes in and I say I'm hurting, and he says, I'm going to have to ask a lot of questions before I give a diagnosis, fine with me. <laughs> so this is more formal, and you give this to them. I, I used to send this to people, and then they would bring it with them, but then people would forget. And uh, so what I've done is just ask if they would come at least a half hour early uh, to our meeting and fill it out. So you have it there, they did it right there, it's fresh on their mind, and you can get right in and ask questions off of it. But when you have a form like this, I, I forget now, is, do you have a copy of this in your appendices or? Yeah. Okay, you do. Is I go right to the back, right to uh, the back questions. And I look immediately, what problem are you having? What brings you here? And I look at that first before I start going back and looking at everything else. And the reason is, is I don't want to step on a landmine here. In other words, they say our whole marriage is falling apart because our son died a year ago. And we haven't been able to handle it. All right? And if I don't read that, and I get over here, I'm saying, uh, oh, I'm just breaking ice, getting to know them, some general things. Oh, you... Yeah, the son, he died a year ago. Oh, okay. That, that is the huge issue in their mind. I've just stepped on it. And now I've got to get involved in the most serious issue, and I really didn't want to deal with that first. Does that make sense? I, I want to really go to some other things. So just, if you use a form like this, just look to see what's the issue first and then go back and I try to be more general and then get to the specific. Now here's another uh, area. Describe the relationship with uh, parents. This isn't Freudian. This is just do you get along with your dad or mom if they're living? Are they separated? Uh, you, you're wanting here the area of relationships. How are they with people in their own family? Uh, God has ordained your family. Not just you, if you, you know, are his elect and he's brought you to himself, but he's ordained your whole family. He knew exactly who you needed in your family uh, to know Christ and be more like him. So, well, you don't, you don't live with my brother. You don't live with my... No, but he ordained that person at, to be your brother or have no brothers or a sister uh, to learn how to love God and love your neighbor, namely, people in your family. If you can't love them, then you're not going to export out of your home much either. So the home is the place, is the place to really work at uh, the commandments of God. How are they doing? What's going on there? And their parents, are they living? Have they, were they raised by someone other than their parents? Which is very common in some cultures. Uh, if someone's married, and I would be more here asking uh, if the husband's there, I'd want to know if it's an issue about him or the family, why she's not present. Uh, if it's a woman, uh, where's the husband at? And if it's, well, he, he's not going to come. He's, uh, he's not even a believer. All right, then I'm going to be thinking of a godly woman who's going to come alongside and help her. All right. Um, Health issues, these are just some of the questions on health. Uh, describe your health, any chronic conditions, important illnesses, uh, last medical exam, uh, the physician's name. There's just uh, current medications. Have you ever used drugs uh, or presently using them? Have you ever been arrested? Hopefully not for killing counselors. <laughs> Uh, you know, just 
some basic questions you could add to this, make it, tailor make it, however you want to, but it's just to get going on data gathering. Uh, from there, there's a whole area here on the spiritual. Well, have you ever seen a counselor? Is one up here. Uh, have you ever been in counseling? And many have. One way or the other, school psychologist, you know, at work a psychiatrist or someone, and, you know, what was the issue? What was going on? Uh, spiritual. You know, do you believe in God? I've had people say no. Do you pray? Yes. <laughs> Uh, had just the opposite too. Uh, would you say you're a Christian or in the process of becoming a Christian? Now you're thinking, as a seminary student would think, what do you mean a process? You know, do you know how many people check that box? Many, many people check that. You know, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not a Christian, but I'm in the process. Uh, the, the, their theology is so weak and watered down or Ar Arminian, you know, just very man-centered or I think I had it and lost it. And I mean, there's so many different views. And what you're after is, are they clear and distinct on their theology? And do they have accurate biblical theology? Have they ever been baptized? Um, how often do you read the Bible? And church they're attending, if it's not at your church, and how often do you attend church? And again, I'm, I'm much like uh, those guys that you heard uh, who, uh, if someone from outside wants counseling, uh, you need to talk with your church leaders. They're the ones that watch over your soul and are your shepherds, not me. Um, and they go, well, I've already talked with them and they can't help me. They don't know what to do. All right, then fine. I'll see you, but bring one of them with you because I want to help train them. Pass on to them what's been passed on to me, not in an arrogant, proud way. I didn't know either. I was referring uh, out of seminary. And so I understand that predicament, but just bring one of them with it. And well, they're unwilling to come. They won't, none of them. Well, then you have to really start thinking about is that kind of shepherds that uh, you want and that you need. Maybe you need to attend uh, this church, now that we're in this sheep stealing, just caring for sheep. Uh, how often do they attend church? Are they involved? How are they serving? That's that key question right there. How are you involved within the church? Are you a taker? Are you a servant? What's happening? Any recent changes in your spiritual life? Uh, any monumental thing that happened lately uh, in your life spiritually? I don't get into major detail here on the spiritual area. Uh, this is not the place where I get right in and go over the gospel with them. I'm on a fact-finding thing. I'm asking a lot of questions. And if it's foggy enough and vague enough, I'm just going to write, I'm going over the gospel, just on my notes. You know, deal with the gospel, probably next week. And the reason I don't do it the same day is I'm already going to spend about two hours with them asking questions. And uh, it's pretty intense. And uh, I know God doesn't lose his elect. So it's not that I'm going to, you know, just shudder uh, and not get any sleep wondering if they're in an accident on the way home and I didn't give them the gospel. And so I'm, I'm looking at a plan here. I want to find out ask enough information, give them hope, hope towards the answers in Christ, and then next week I'm going to go over the gospel with them. So I'm just gathering enough information to sort of get some bearings on where are they spiritually. Here's a problem checklist, things they can check off. Some will just check one. You know, they come in, they just say it's a lust issue, it's a sexual issue, and just check it. Others will check all kinds of boxes. I had one person check almost all of them. And I, I just thought, oh, wow. You know, I, I don't believe in years and years of counseling, but this is, a, you know, there's a, there's a lot of them here. And what she did was this. She was unclear on problem checklist. She thought, have I ever had any problem with any of these? And so when I started, I said, okay, uh, I got down here to, um, which one? Uh... It was early on, I asked, uh, like anxiety, 
And she said, yeah, you know, when I was seven, when, um, I mean, here she is in her 40s. When I was seven, you know, my mom was hospitalized, and I, I was, okay. <laughs> We're going to go, <laughs> she has encountered all these issues in her life. I need to clarify this on our PDI form. I think I had to put current problem <laughs> checklist. It's just what are they struggling with currently? And then just ask questions off of those issues. I just write right on the paper with a different color ink. If that's helpful to you. Otherwise, what I'm going to have to do if I don't do that, I'm on a separate piece of paper. I'm going to have to ask the question, write the question, then write the answer to even know what this is about, the blank piece of paper. So I write right on this form in a different color ink so I know what my writing is and theirs. And I'll just write, and they go, last, appetite's a problem. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I'm not hungry much. And I'll just write, not hungry much. And have you gotten a good medical checkup? Does a doctor know about this? You know, is it related to? Uh, so just some comments off each of the problems there. And then lastly is this form. What's the problem? What, what brings you here? Uh, you talk about A from an A to a B, quick response here, and I may have mentioned this to you about the husband and wife. Uh, I mentioned that where she said she's 39 and her husband's 12. She wrote it down on her PDI form. Uh, she was sitting here, her husband's sitting there. And I, I, looked at, I looked at her form, I looked at his, and he said, communication problems. <laughs> And she just put here, what brings you here? I'm 39, my husband's 12. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I'm faced with both these forms in front of me, and I said, uh, call him Larry. Larry, uh, did, you, did you look what your wife wrote? Because they traveled a few hours to get up to uh, where, where I was at. And uh, have you looked at each other's, and have you looked at your wife's, and no? All right. Uh, I'm going to tell you what she wrote. She said the problem is that she's 39 and you're 12. And then he went, <laughs> yeah, she's right. And I said, nah, I, I think I understand a lot. Just from that response, uh, he's ex he was extremely immature. And that's what she was trying to say. I, I feel like I'm dealing with a kid. And he didn't want to own up to a, a leadership. Uh, you talk about biblical masculinity. I mean, let's, let's become a leader. Let's be the biblical leader. Uh, take on responsibility. He just wanted her to lead and make all the decisions. And... Uh, and then down here, any other information we should know? You know what he wrote? She smokes, and when I kiss her, it's like kissing an ashtray. She smokes, and when I kiss her, it's like kissing an ashtray. Uh, so I brought that up to her. Just, it's in, you never know what people are going to write here. One, one lady, a deacon and his wife, uh, having marital problems, and down here, any information we should know, she wrote, my husband goes and talks to our dead son every day at the graveyard. And on the front, yep, they had a, a son that died a few years back, and every day on his way to work, he stops at the, the graveyard and, and talks. And I had to find out what that meant. Uh, what have you done about the problem? Most common answer is what? Pray. Pray about it. Don't just go on from there. Start asking questions on you pray, you pray what? What do you pray? Because they'll think they're being biblical, but it's more like a James 4. You have not because you ask not, and when you ask, you what? You ask amiss. You spend it on your own pleasures. You, you're praying selfishly. So don't bypass prayer. Other people put read. I read. I've read on this issue. What have you read? Because most, most books that are out there, at least in Christian bookstores, 
are horrendous. Uh, that'll take them away from scripture rather than towards it. What are your expectations from counseling? What do you expect of, of us? You know, we're here to help you, but what do you expect of us? You're coming here, why? Well, what do you want? What, what are you hoping for? And that will be helpful too on uh, gathering their, uh, their goals. Well, let's take a break, about a 10 minute break, about quarter after. Uh, if you'll come back and I'm just gonna keep moving through the uh, material here. All right, so quarter after. All right, we're gonna uh, cover a few more things here on gathering data. And I put up another form. This is from a, a Wayne Max material, Preparing for Marriage God's Way, in his workbook. He has this form in there on, it's called a Spiritual Convictions Questionnaire. And again, you can make your own on this. Come up with questions you wanna ask people uh, just their basic belief on various things, like that one. God is fill in the blank. And you don't want them to sit down with Burkhoff. And, you know, I don't want to sit, them to sit down with the Bible either. I want them to, on a piece of paper, fill in the blank. God is what? Uh, who is Jesus? What is a Christian? And see what you can do with this form is I give it to them after the first session after the first time I meet with them. And there's hope in Christ, but I need to know some more information on where you're at spiritually, your, your spiritual beliefs. So if you'll fill this out this week and then bring it back with you next week, that's gonna be very helpful for me. And you can start looking at their answers. Sin is, uh, my chief sins are, when I sin, how do they deal with sin? And then there's more questions too. My chief goal in life is, uh, I pray, how, and again, you can come up with your own uh, questions, but it's just gathering more information that's going to help you as you go over the gospel with them. Now, they're asking proper questions on page 53. There are two forms as you ask questions. Uh, let me back that up a bit. There is an intensive questioning and an extensive questioning. When someone comes in and says, I'm struggling with finances, I'm a major debt, and I'm struggling, some friends of mine have talked about declaring bankruptcy. I wanna know what you think about that. Well, in the area of finances, that's what they said their problem is. Well, we're gonna intensively put the spotlight on finances. And I'm gonna just ask a lot of questions, patterns, spending habits, work habits, everything related to money. I'm just gonna ask a lot of information here. Now, I'm not a CPA either. And I don't, I'm not gonna get into micromanaging their budget. I'm looking for a heart that's behind this, spiritual issues that God's word addresses, uh, the finances. Now, I may ask a friend of mine who is a CPA who could sit down with them if they need some help once they've dealt with heart issues to get them in, you know, set on how best to work with their money in a, in a budget type fashion. But when they present their issue, it's it's finances, or they come in and say, you know, we're, our marriage is really struggling. <clears throat> well, then we're gonna focus on that marriage down there. Or they say, you know, it's this person at church, you know, Yodia Syntyche type situation. Well, okay, church, uh, it's, it's church related and relationships, let's really look at that intensively. Then I'm, you use the extensive questioning to start firing questions in other areas of their life because no sin is ever isolated. Heart issues are never isolated in one area. If they have a lack of self-control with money, do you think that's the only area they're gonna have a lack of self-control in? Probably not, all right? That fruit of the spirit just, it shows up other places too when there's a lack of it. Um, 
if they say, you know, it's all about work. Um, well, you look at the heart and you find out they're sacrificing their health, their diet, friendships, no time for church. That's what extensive questioning will do is find out where else are they, are there some hot spots and issues surfacing up. If someone is selfish in marriage, do you think it's the only place they're selfish in? <laughs> you know, that's what you're looking for in the extensive type. All right. If you want a diagram of this, I'll just make copies for you. It'll be, all right. Sometimes people will say, I don't have time to do any homework. You're, you're talking about giving me homework. And I do. I ask for about three hours a week. Uh, six days, a half hour. That's what I'm looking for. Because oftentimes they're not even in a habit of spending time in the Word and prayer on a daily basis. So giving them homework that's going to be biblically related, I want to get them into a pattern of every day spending time uh, and, and their walk with the Lord and the Word and being a student of the Word. So I'm looking for about three hours, and they say, well, I don't have time for that. I didn't have time to do any of the work today or for this week. Well, one of my assignments might be something like this the next week. See this schedule? <laughs> Every half hour, I want to know what you're doing in a week. That uh, perplexes me that uh, you get up. I, I want to know when you get up on a given day. And if your schedule is very different, if you get up before 5, or if you go to bed after 12, then we'll just re recalculate the, the times here. But I w I'd like to know, just on half-hour increments, what do you do with your days? As you, don't, you didn't come to church. You said you were too busy. you not doing homework. I, I just want to see. And then next week, <laughs> wow, you, you, have a, you have some a lot of time here. And the reason is, people, when they have to fill something like this out, they, they realize that they do have time. But they're not going to say, didn't have time to do the work, but boy, I watched those games, those playoff games. And uh, I spent, wow, 20 hours watching TV. Um, and then all the sports highlights on Sunday morning, I can't put that down there. <laughs> you know, you're going to see it. Do you understand what happens here? And so their schedule that they turn in next time looks really good. This has not been their pattern but you can still see where they can spend some time. And eventually, you want to help them get to the place where they, they're putting things down in an orderly manner and trying to live out the biblical priorities of their life, at least as a tool. This isn't a master, it's just a tool to get them thinking how to live a life that's more uh, living by priorities, biblical priorities. All right, relevant questions. Uh, there's an area you want to ask. Uh, when you're asking questions, don't ask questions to just satisfy your curiosity. Ask questions that are relevant to the problem. Uh, sometimes you'll find out someone is involved in something. They go, you know, I work for the government. Oh, what kind of work are you inv involved in? Well, in the FBI. Oh, yeah, what do you do? You know? Uh, do you know anything about what happened back there in Washington and all these kind of things? I was reading the paper. You, you know, that's not relevant to what we're dealing with here. You know, some people are going, well, you know, I'm a computer uh, programmer. You know, I just got a new Dell, and I'm having trouble with this. I have a question that's just not relevant at that time. All right, just ask questions that pertain to the, the situation, questions that find facts. Why questions you're asking for subjective answers? You know, why'd you do that? I don't know. Now they're going to give you an answer, and it may not be correct, but it's a subjective reply. It doesn't mean you can't ask why questions, but just be careful with that one. I mean, you, you watch a, a brother hit a sister, and you say, why'd you hit your sister? <laughs> I don't know. She deserved it. Uh, you got a little information there, but it's a subjective reply. These questions get more factual data. What happened? 
you know, when, where, those are better fact-finding questions. Open-ended questions. Be careful about using yes or no reply questions. You know, do you like being here at church? Yes. Well, it doesn't give you a whole lot. Uh, Open-ended questions uh, are going to give you more information. You have an example there. You know, you want to get married? No. Uh, well, an open-ended question would be, what are your thoughts about marriage? Now you're going to get more information. And as you're asking questions, open-ended are better. They'll, they'll give you much more of their thoughts and beliefs. Think of that, you guys who are single, and if you date or court or whatever you call it, uh, open-ended questions are better than closed-ended. You'll get them to talk more. They'll, they'll reveal their heart and mind better. That's just a side point. A little rabbit trail for you. Letter E, specific questions. Avoid fuzzy questions. Uh, questions that are vague. You know, uh, for example, how did it go this week? Good. All right. Next question. That, does, that doesn't give you anything. Good as in, yeah, she was gone for a week. You know, she was gone for a retreat for a week. Well, that's not good. You said the week went good. When she's gone, it's good. That's not what I would call good. Don't be fuzzy. We sin in the specific and concrete. Ask questions in the specific and concrete. Because change has to happen in the specific and concrete. You just don't say, well, you need to be a better husband this week. That's not going to work. What's that mean? And next week, were you a better husband this past week? Yeah. Okay. I, you know, it's all general, fuzzy. Uh, be, be specific and concrete. We had a fight last night, someone might say. What happened? That's too general for me. A fight? What does that mean? Well, we got mad. Okay. What exactly happened? I want to get real specific here. Well, she threw something at me. Are we talking a piece of paper? Are we talking a pot? A uh, steak knife? You know, what? what uh... <laughs> Letter F. Withhold judgment. This is very difficult to do. And I just, I say it is for me. Uh, I, I don't know about you. Very difficult to withhold judgment when you hear someone plead their case, right? right? Proverbs uh, 18, 17. The first one to plead their case seems just. You want to side with them, especially if there's some feeling and emotion with it and some tears. You just, oh, you know, you, you already made a judgment. And you have to be very careful of saying, I. I hear this, but I know there's another side. And, and I, I would do very and, and, and total injustice here if I just take one, one report without getting the, the full data. Withhold judgment until you've gathered all the material. I could tell you so many times I have failed on that, um, of hearing the first case and sort of formulating what's going on without hearing the other side. Uh, letter G, mark the important areas for further questioning. Remember I said that, like in the spiritual area, they go, I'm in the process. Well, what do you mean by that? Could you explain you're in the process of becoming a Christian? I'll mark that and say, I'm going to explore that even more. Maybe you're not right now. Uh, I'll see if they'll clarify it, but when I go over the gospel with them, we're going to cover that in more detail. Mark areas that are going to be, uh, otherwise you're going to be going off on every tangent in that first time. Say, well, you know, I, I get along well with my father, and now he doesn't. Well, okay, I'm, I'm, I'll get to him, and if he says, oh, you know, our struggles go way back, I might just put, you know, I'll, I'm going to gather more information here. We're going to, I'm looking at the tips of icebergs. I can't get into every huge issue uh, totally on that first time I meet with someone. I'm going to ask, 
just saying explore later that area. Uh, letter H on page 54. Observe their countenance. I don't know who uh, coined this, who came up with this, but uh, Halo data. I know Jay Adams refers to it, but I don't know if he you know, originated with him. You're just talking about nonverbal. Uh, how a person appears to you just outwardly. You know, if she comes in and she says, oh, thank you, you know, I'm so glad that, that you'll meet with us, and he just sort of drags in. There's, there's halo data there. I'm not sure what that means. I don't know if he just got off a, a late night work shift and he's tired. I don't know if he's feeling well. I don't, all I know is it's communicating something to me, and now I have to ask questions to find out what is it I'm seeing. Halo data, do not make conclusions on it, or you'll be like, uh, Eli with Hannah, accusing her of being drunk when he did, just halo data, looked like she was, he was, had a wrong conclusion. So you just want to ask questions. So if I say, okay, Larry, you know, you're not 12 anymore, you're, you're 40 something. Now last week, how did it go with uh, the areas of working your spiritual walk with the Lord. How did it go? And he goes, great. And she goes, oh. <laughs> Now, he, that's why when you're taking notes, you don't look like this, take notes. You'd have missed the whole, the whole thing. It went well, good. Went well, and she's going, oh. <laughs> and See, then you look back up, and they're both looking at you. And you, you, missed, you missed a total area of communication. So you abbreviate when you take notes. And I put in quotes things that I want in quotes that I may come back with that they said. You know, for me to live as my family. That's a good quote because that's going to have to be taken to Philippians and shown that it was wrong. So I'm, I, I abbreviate and I look up, especially on answers like that. It went well. And she does that number, I say, Sue, unless you're wearing contacts and something was caught in your eye, <laughs> I did just detected by your, your uh, response there, do you disagree with his, his answer? And then if she says, yeah, I actually do. I just, I have this, uh, you know, neck problem, uh, you know, I've got, it, it might be, I don't know them. Usually, though, you're right and, and you, in your assessment, and she says, that ah, it was not good at all. He didn't spiritually lead us at all. Oh, spiritual leadership to him meant have a quiet time, a devotion time. To her, it meant get us up on Sunday, lead us in family devotions. They had a whole different definition of what it meant, and we need to clarify that. But just halo data. Again, it can be misread. Other methods of gathering information, you can talk to other people, ask their permission, but uh, say, I'd like to talk with some family members or some friends or roommates or whoever, and like to get some information. You say you've served in the children's ministry for 10 years. I'd like to talk with the pastor over that and uh, just whatever information that they can help me with. So maybe some things that they've noticed or things that would be helpful. We, we're here to help you. Give them your perspective and invite their feedback. Uh, after you gather information, you say, I think this is uh, the issues that are going on. And there's no Gnostic ability here. It's just asking questions, using the scriptures. Uh, any believer filled with God's word and seeking to live it uh, can be apt to counsel others. So there's no Gnostic ability. Uh, you know, they said this is what's going on in our life. You take it through. God's word, what God says about it, invite their feedback. This is what sounds like is going on. What do you think? Uh, re, uh, sometimes you can observe them outside the session, out outside the time you meet with them, and that you can only do if they're in your church, if they're coming to your church. Very difficult to observe them outside a meeting time if they go somewhere else. But in their church, I can remember one guy said, you know, I just really want to, I really want to pastor, you know, I really want to 
Uh, I don't know why the Lord isn't opening up an opportunity. And then I just watched them in a fellowship group. And they didn't reach out to anyone. They just sat there. They got their donut and coffee and just sat there. And they didn't reach out uh, before, during, after. And just saying, you know, why do you, why do you want to uh, be a pastor? Because I, I love the gospel. I really want to preach the gospel. And remember what Tim, uh, when he was here last week, said, you've got to love people. That's who you're preaching to. You don't love to preach, you love people. And preaching is to communicate the word to the people you love. And you want them to know Christ. And so I talked to him about that, but I observed that outside the time. And then when we met together, I said, you know, I, I've just noticed over the past few weeks that, you know, I never noticed it before because I wasn't looking. But just watching, you don't reach out to people. And so this next time, before we get back together, uh, I'd like you to tell me about a few people in that fellowship group uh, that you meet each Sunday. Some new people, reach out, love them, pray for them, get involved in their life. Uh, record conversations at home. A lot of people don't like to do this. Some will do it. They'll put a tape player on and saying, you know, we, every time we get into conversation, we can't resolve anything. We can't communicate. Remember this. If you can't communicate, you can't resolve conflict. Right? If you can't communicate, you can't resolve conflict. Uh, I mean, you have to be able to communicate to work through a conflict. They say, well, we have financial problems. We have different perspectives on finances, and we can't communicate. Well, you're not going to resolve uh, the finances then. You have to learn how to communicate biblically to actually sit down and work through uh, a serious matter. And at times, uh, recording a tape player, and I have listened to a few tapes, and they're, they are just provoking each other in the things they say. And they don't even know it. They're just clueless. This is their habit pattern. Just saying, well, you spend money like your mom. <laughs> Boy, that just, you just hear her go off on, yeah, yeah, yeah and you earn about as enough as, as my dad used to earn, you know, and you go, you know, whoa, what is that? You know, they're slinging these comments. And they're going on and saying, see, we can't even communicate. Oh, <laughs> you're communicating, it's just not biblically, you know, it's not biblical communication. So recording or writing down he said, she said, there's different methods of doing that. Listen to their prayers. Uh, later on as you're ministering to them, listen to them pray. And uh, they reveal their theology if it's self-focused, if it's on uh, not my will but your will be done. I mean, a lot of people as they're thinking through their prayers it is revealing uh, their relationship with God, their communion with him. And it's a snapshot. You can't you know, develop a, a lot too much from that. Data gathering homework. That's like that spiritual convictions questionnaire or the schedule. Uh, homework that you give them that actually gives you more information back. That's other ways of gathering more. I'm just going to keep moving if I can, unless it's a really quick... Well, how much time do you spend gathering data from? Uh, you know, it, it never stops, actually. Uh, gathering information never stops. Uh, so the, how much do you get before you start, before you figure beyond Proverbs? Right. Yeah, the question is, how, when do you stop? I mean, you could go on for weeks and weeks and weeks gathering information. I think within, especially depending on what the issue is, if you spend a couple of hours initially really gathering uh, broad base, extensive and intensive, at least even the tips of the icebergs in their life, uh, you're doing well because then as you go to each issue, as you meet with them, then you can gather more information with questions. But every week I meet with someone, every time that I meet with someone, I'm asking questions, um, but not in the concentrated form as I do in that first time. It's usually the first time, about two hours, I, I'm just putting a general time on it, and maybe part of the time, the second time. Because during that first week and the second, or the first time I meet in the second week, I've got even more questions uh, based on the information I go over 
So I'll spend about a half of the time the next session too asking more clarifying questions because I want to come at them with an interpretation biblically of what's happening and where we're going from there. Unless they're an unbeliever and then I'm just going to go over the gospel and let them know that. Uh, other, um, well, the importance of listening, I don't know if I need to cover that too much. I think you realize how uh, necessary it is. Um, it's a rash speech, rash answering uh, is deadly. Uh, it requires self-control to listen. And some things you really want to listen for. Oh, by the way, there is a psalm. Oh, I want to say it's in the 100s. I didn't write it down. I mean, that, that doesn't help you a whole lot, does it? Um, it starts off, some of you can probably locate it on your computer. Oh, here it is. Psalm 116, verse 1. Listen to what it says. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me. And the psalm starts off, I love him because he listens to me. And you know, that's a way of showing love to people, true sacrifice. Maybe you have things on your mind that need to get done, but just listening to people is a way of communicating love. And in turn, people say, you listened, and I love you because you listened. It's interesting. That's a Psalm 116. It requires self-control, and you listen for a few things. Listen for blame shifting. Number one, sin. Right? People don't want to be responsible for their own sin. Right from the garden in Genesis 3 on. I mean, it's been blame shifting. There is some reason why I sinned, and it's not my fault. <laughs> you know, it's a dysfunctional family, dysfunctional body, dysfunctional church, something. But it's not me. Listen for blame shifting. Uh, number two there, or letter B, listen for words like, I can't. I can't do what God says. I can't do right. Because you want to address that. That's unbiblical thinking. Or I'm unable, or it's too much. And you hear that word too much, or those two words there, it might be that there's too much going on in their life and they're going to have to scale down in their priorities and get back to biblical priorities. Uh, maybe they are a Martha and need to cease some of that stuff and get in and sit down and listen to Christ in their life. You know, they may have to do some things. They have too much going on. Uh, a victim mentality. This is a person who gets into a martyr complex that, you know, I'm, I've been victimized uh, I should self-pity. People should just have pity on me. I'm a victim in life. We're calling sin sickness. And that's very popular today, you know, with terms like alcoholism. Uh, rabbit trails, where uh, they love talking about what they want to talk about, but not exactly what you need to talk about when you're meeting with them. You have to really ask yourself, is this pertinent to the problem at hand? Sometimes listen for what they don't say. You know, I have sat at times in, in uh, getting to know some people, and I, I've, I've noticed this more in the past few years, uh, where people will talk about their family, and you listen and they're talking about certain members of their family and leaving other members out. You go, yeah, you know, I, you know my wife and I, we have, uh, you know, four children, they might say. Uh, oh, you know, our son, he's involved in this. And then a second oldest, you know, is she's doing this. Yeah. Okay. And um, the other two? <laughs> And uh, just this past year, I was talking with someone like that, and the head just went down. So the other two, boy, they're just, they bring such grief uh, to our soul. 
there's where ministry can take place, right there. You know, and it's, sometimes it's not what they talk about, it's what they don't talk about. You know, they talk all about their mom, and you say, well, is your dad living? Yeah. You didn't mention him at all. Well, pff, you, I mean, why should I? I mean, and you're going to gather a lot of information right there. <laughs> sometimes, you know, you're, you're listening to things, and, but what is it they're leaving out? Uh, listen for the area of hopelessness, where there doesn't seem any reason to persevere. Without hope, they won't persevere. And it's not that a Christian doesn't have hope, it's that they lose focus on their hope. They get their eyes off of God, off of his promises, and they put their hope elsewhere, and now they're in the area of despair. Page 55. Uh, evasiveness. You know, people like to go off on a, a shoot off down a side road when you get on a hot spot. And uh, some are very evasive. For example, back in Genesis, Cain, where's your brother? Oh, am I my brother's keeper? That wasn't the question. That's evasive tactics to get you off on some other topic. Um, you know, when you're asking people about situations that are very uh, delicate and it, it, that's where you need to go as far as areas in their life, like where were you after work? She said you weren't home. Where were you? Do I always have to answer everything my, my wife has to ask? I mean, is that, well, what is that? That's evasiveness. Where were you? And then watch for partial truths, too. Exaggerations. Always, never. Told you a million times. Uh, defensiveness it usually comes out in anger. Uh, it's pride, but it gets defensive, and it usually displays itself in anger. Uh, it's just like a cobra, you know, that the neck starts coming out. <laughs> And you know, it starts lifting up and fangs and just a defensive posture. And it gets anger. And why did they get that way? Did they misunderstand something or did they understand it and they're, it's their pride? Or judging another's motives. It's called presumption. It's one of the deadliest sins in a marriage. Presumption. It's like this. I know what you said, but I know what you're thinking. You know, I, you don't want to say this, but you're thinking, is there a vacancy in the Trinity? You know, are you omniscient? Uh, you don't know people's motives. You don't know their motives. And we're told, stay away from judging people's motives. And uh, I want to say it's 2 Corinthians 4, or 1 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, no. 1 Corinthians 4, yes, verses uh, 5 through, well, just verse 5 would be, fine, wait until the Lord comes, who will bring both the light things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and they, each man's praise will come to him from God. God's the one, and even up before then, don't judge one another motive-wise. It's, it's death to a relationship when presumption's in there. It's then you can't do right. No matter what you do, you're judged. She brought flowers home. I know what you want. N no, I just I saw them. They were after a good. No, I know what you want. And you, it's death. You you can't. You just give up. And it's deadly. And you need to deal with that. Judging another's motives. Letter L. Willingness to accept responsibility. Again, you're listening for these kind of things. Are they accepting that? they're part of the sin, the sin issue. I can remember one couple where uh, they were having a marital conflict, and I said, all right, uh, this is a marriage situation. Uh, if this was the marriage problems from her perspective, and this is his, divide the pie up. From your perspective, divide the pie up. And I went with him first. He said, well, I, I think this is, this is her and this is me. You know, I thought to myself, that's not bad. 
you know, sometimes they go all 50-50. I said, there's no right or wrong here. There's no, I'm not looking for 50-50, just as you see it. He goes, I, I think I'll take, I think it's probably more like, you know, 60 or, or so and 40 for her. And I said to her, uh, how would you divide it up? She said, 100% him. <laughs> and I said, uh, no, what I, I obviously I might have miscommunicated here. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm talking about that you've sinned before, during, or after as it relates to your marriage. That's what I'm talking about. Did you sin? Did you provoke? Uh, in, in the fights you're talking about, all these fights that happen, do you sin in those? Uh, and sin in response of hatred, man, you know, that's what I'm talking about. Sin, before, during, after, you know, in the life of your marriage. So, all right. Now, what slice would you cut for yourself, for him and you? She said, 100% him. It only happened once in, in 22 years of, of ministry. I, I, once. And I said, well, would, would you settle for this? <laughs> um, <laughs> and she said no. Both professing Christians. And right there, I'm going through scripture and thinking, you can't even be a Christian and think that way. How do you have a poor in spirit? Uh, blessed are those who mourn. You know, uh, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Uh, how, do you even, how are you even saved with that kind of view? And then in a marriage, when they're talking about fights and all kinds of stuff, I didn't sin. And I, I just, I went over it. I couldn't, and she got up and she walked out. She said, I'm not here to talk about me. And I sense that you're just, you're trying to make an issue here. And I've had it. She walked out, walked out of the marriage. Uh, and so I dealt with him. And he just, you know, he's grown. Uh, and she went ahead with a divorce. Very difficult. Not a member here. But usually what you're looking for is this. <laughs> this is the, the more. Uh, let's say she goes, this is me, that's him. Well, okay, I mean, it's close enough. Uh, it, and it wouldn't even bother me. Seriously, it wouldn't even bother me had she went like this. Me, him. Because once we get into scripture, this thing is going to expand. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing how it does that. And so all I, I think, there's no right or wrong here. What I, I do is say this. Let's call him Larry. You said 60%. God holds you 100% responsible to remove this 60% out of your marriage, of your sin. Areas where you have failed and come short. God holds you 100% responsible to get that log out. That 60%. You work on that 60. Forget about her 40. You work at your 60. Now, Mary, or whatever name we make up for her, all right, Mary, you uh, cut yourself here 10%. God holds you 100% responsible to take that 10% piece out and deal with your part of the marriage problem. And somehow, 60 and 10 equal 100, right? That's the way it works. It's, and what it does is helps them focus on their own sin. That's Matthew 7. Get the log out of your own eye first. And uh, even if one's not present, dealing with one guy now whose wife's not even part of the marriage, I mean, she's split, but they're still communicating, we're working with him. You know, he needs to do right. He needs to be a godly man. Um, and we'll see what, what she does. 
So that's one way of doing it. Well, I'm over time. Let me just finish this number four. I'll just read through them. Listening habits to avoid. Don't interrupt very quickly here. There's only a couple times you would interrupt someone. One, if they're sinning. Gossiping, slander, swearing. I mean, sometimes right in front of you, husband and wife will just start going at it. Uh, start cussing at each other, swearing. And you say, whoa. <laughs> or cutting each other down. Don't interrupt unless they're sinning. Number two, if they're going on and on and on and on and on, you're saying, this is, they've given me the answer. I'm going to have to try to interject here. Some people just will go on and, and even talk while they're breathing in. It's, uh, <laughs> it's amazing. And you just have to say, whoa, uh, wait. And you don't have to do that often, but it's just... Uh, letter B, don't jump to conclusions. Pray and ask God for grace to uh, be patient with people and not jump to conclusions. Don't let your mind wander. And again, pray. Ask God for help to keep your mind set on the person who's talking and follow with them. Don't do distracting things. I sat with a guy one time, he was sitting in, uh, a seminary student. He's long gone, not in the room. But he was sitting in observing uh, and counseling. And in the office, uh, as I was talking with them, I look, I just see how the, my eye here, he's looking up at the bookshelves. <laughs> you know, looking, checking out books. <laughs> And I'm talking with them, and they can see him. They can watch me, and my face is there. And they're looking, you know, you can see him, and you just look in. What, uh, anything distracting, uh, stay away from. That, that was distracting. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't allow the person to waste time. Again, you're not helping them if week after week they come and meet with you and say, I didn't do my homework. I haven't done anything you asked me to do. Next week, didn't do anything that you asked. Depending on what the issue is, you might say something like this. You know, to be a good steward in your life and in mine, and I want to help you, the things that you're saying, there are no reasons for this. This is excuses. It's, it's obviously not as important as you, you say it is in your life. Uh, excuses are the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie, right? That's, a, that's an excuse. Sounds like it's a reason. And just saying, let's do this, because I don't want to be like my old piano teacher when I didn't practice and was just sort of slap my, my hands and, um, you know, week after week. I, I don't, this is, you know, this isn't like a little school, you know, uh, teacher with a student who's not doing, you're an adult, you know, you said these are issues, you want to work at them, I want to help you, let's do this. And unless, again, unless it's a major sin issue that we'd have to go into church discipline on, when you finish it, call and let's get together. Because it could look like you're coming because your wife wants you to come, but you're really not doing the work. And she's frustrated. She knows your heart's not in this. At least it seems like that. And that would be a better way to say it. It doesn't seem like it is. So why don't you call, we'll get together as soon as you finish it. And that way I'm not going back over, because I want to build and let's grow and move. And again, that would be after finding information. Don't hesitate to ask if you don't understand. Don't wait until we meet again to say, I didn't understand that assignment you gave. Well, call me. Don't wait a week. If there's something you don't understand, let's, let's discuss that. So those are things to... Again, asking information. Uh, you know what's so hard about going over this information is that we teach courses on this. And uh, I have to try to do it in a few uh, class periods, but it's uh, semester-long classes on all of this. So again, I'm try to uh, summarize as best I can. It's hard to do. Well, thank you for being patient with me, and let's... Uh, bow in prayer, and then uh, meet again next week. Father, thank you again for your patience with us. Uh, thank you for people that you brought into our lives that have discipled us and cared for us 
and how they have done it in a very Christ-like manner. We pray that we might be more like our Savior in how we love people and care for them and, and minister in a very uh, biblical manner. Lord, bless these men, encourage them in their relationships, uh, whether they're married or uh, have families or roommates or just people in the church. Help us to be uh, caring people. Uh, we commit that to you in Jesus' name. Amen.